So here is a graph of economic growth over the last two millennia. As you can see, for a very long time, there was very little growth. But then it gradually started to pick up during the 1700s and 1800s. And then in the 20th century, it really skyrocketed. So now the question is, what can we tell about future growth on the basis of this picture of past growth? So here is one possibility, which is perhaps the one which is closest at hand, namely that growth will continue into the future and hopefully into the long-term future. And that will mean not only greater wealth, but also better health, extended lifespan, more scientific discoveries, and more human flourishing in all kinds of other ways. So a much better long-term future in all kinds of ways. But unfortunately, that's not the only possibility because experts, they worry that it could be that growth continues for some time, but then civilization collapses. For instance, because of a, a nuclear war between great powers or an accident involving powerful AI systems. And they worry then that civilization wouldn't recover uh, from such a collapse. Uh, so the philosopher Nick Bostrom at Oxford, he has called these kinds of collapses or catastrophes existential catastrophes. Uh, so um, one kind of existential catastrophes, that's human extinction. That is that the, the human species go extinct, no humans ever live anymore. So that will be my sole focus here. But he also defines another kind of existential catastrophe, which is uh, that humanity doesn't go extinct, but its potential it's, uh, is permanently and drastically curtailed. But I won't talk uh, about such existential catastrophes here. So, together with another uh, Oxford philosopher, the late Derek Parfit, Bostrom have argued, has argued that uh, human extinction would be uniquely bad, much worse than non-existential catastrophes. And that is because extinction would forever deprive humanity of a potentially grand future, the grand future that we saw on one of the preceding slides. Uh, so, in order to make this intuition clear and vivid, Derek Parfit created the following thought experiment uh, where he asked us to consider three outcomes. First, peace. Second, a nuclear war that kills 99%, that is near extinction. And then third, uh, a nuclear war that kills 100%, that is extinction. So Parfit's ranking of these outcomes from best to worst was as follows. So peace is the best. Uh, and then uh, near extinction is number two, and then extinction is the worst. So no surprises so far. <laughs> um, but then he asks uh, a more interesting question perhaps, namely, which difference in terms of badness is greater? Is it the first difference, as we call it, uh, uh, that between peace and 99% dead, or the second difference between 99% dead and 100% dead? So this is a piece of terminology that I will use throughout this talk, the, the, the first difference and, and second uh, difference. So it's good if you remember this terminology. Um, so which difference you find the greater? That depends on what key value you have. So if your key value is the badness of individual deaths or the, 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 all the individuals that suffer, then you're gonna think that the first difference is greater because um, the first difference is greater in terms of individual deaths it's because like 99% minus zero is more than 100% minus 99%. But there's also another key value which one might have uh, and that is that uh, extinction and the lost future that it entails is very bad. And of course, only the third of these outcomes, 100% dead, um, means extinction and a lost future. Uh, so only the second difference involves a comparison between an extinction and a non-extinction outcome. So this means that if you focus on the badness and extinction and the lost future in it, it entails, then you're gonna think that the second difference is greater. So uh, Parfit, he hypothesized that most people will find the first difference to be greater because they're gonna focus on the individual deaths and all the individuals that suffer. So this is an effect in psychological hypothesis. But his own ethical view 
uh, that was that the second difference is greater. Uh, so in effect, that means that extinction is uniquely bad, uh, as I said, much worse than a, a non-existential catastrophe. And that is because his key value was uh, the lost future that it was, this would entail. So then, um, uh, together with my colleagues uh, Lucius Caviola and Nadia Faber at the University of Oxford, we wanted to test this psychological hypothesis of parfits, namely that people don't find extinction uniquely bad. So we did this using a slightly tweaked version of Parfit's hypothesis. So we, we asked again uh, people on different online platforms uh, to consider three outcomes. Uh, but the first outcome wasn't peace because we found that people had certain positive emotional associations with the word peace and we didn't want that to confound us. Instead we just said there's no catastrophe. And with regards to the second outcome, we made two changes. We, we replaced nuclear war with a generic catastrophe because we weren't specifically interested in nuclear war. And then we reduced the number of deaths from 99% to 80% because we wanted people to believe that it's likely that you, you could recover from this catastrophe. Um, and then this third one was then that 100% died. And again, we, we then first asked uh, people to rank the, the three outcomes. And then our hypothesis was that most people would rank these outcomes as Parfit thought that one should, namely that no catastrophe is the best and then near extinction is the second and extinction is the worst. Um, and this was indeed the case, 90% gave this ranking and all other rankings only got 10% between them. Um, but then we went on uh, to another question and this we only gave to those participants who had given this uh, predicted ranking. So the other 10%, they were out of the study from now on. Uh, so then we asked, in terms of badness, which difference is greater? The first difference between no catastrophe and near extinction, and as you recall, Parfit's hypothesis was that most people would find this difference to be greater, or the second difference between near extinction and extinction, meaning that extinction is uniquely bad. And then we found that Parfit was indeed right, uh, a clear majority found the first difference to be greater and only a minority found extinction to be uniquely bad. So then we wanted to know why is it that people don't find extinction uniquely bad? So is it because they focus really strongly on the first key value, they, they really focus on the badness of individual deaths and individual suffering? Or is it because they focus only weakly on the, on the other key value, on the badness of extinction and the lost future, which it entails. So we included a series of manipulations in our study to test these hypotheses. So some of these, they decreased the badness of individual suffering, and others emphasized or increased the badness uh, of a lost future. So they latched on to uh, uh, either the first or the second of these hypotheses then. So this meant that the condition which I've shown you the results from, that, that acted as a control condition, and then we had a number of experimental conditions or manipulations. So in total, this meant that we had more than 1,200 participants uh, in a British sample, a fairly large study. We also ran another stub, uh, study which, uh, which was identical on a US sample, and that yielded similar results. But I will here <laughs> focus on the larger British sample. So our first manipulation involved zebras. So here we had exactly uh, the same three outcomes uh, like uh, uh, in the control condition, only that we replaced humans with zebras. So our reasoning here was that people likely empathize less with individual zebras. They don't feel as strongly with an individual uh, zebra that is dies as they do with a, an individual human that dies. So therefore, there would be less focus on individual suffering, uh, the first key value. Whereas people might still care pretty strongly about the zebra species, uh, we thought. So extinction would still uh, be bad. So overall, this would mean that uh, more people would find extinction uniquely bad when it comes to zebras. So that was our hypothesis, and it was proved true. So uh, significantly larger proportion of people found extinction uniquely bad when it comes to zebras, 44% versus 23%. Uh, so then our second manipulation, here we went back to humans, 
but what we changed was that the humans were no longer getting killed, but in, instead they couldn't have any children. And of course, if uh, no one can have children, then humanity will eventually go extinct. So uh, here, uh, again, we, we, felt that we thought that people will feel less about sterilization than about death. So then there will be less of a focus on the first key value, individual suffering, whereas extinction and the lost future that it entails is as bad as in the control condition. So overall, this should make more people find extinction uniquely bad when it comes to sterilization. Uh, and this hypothesis was also proved true. So here we found that 47% uh, um, found extinction to be uniquely bad in, in this condition. Again, that was a, a significant difference com compared to the control condition. And then our third manipulation was somewhat different. So here we had again the, control, the three outcomes from the control condition. But then after that, we added uh, the, the following text. Please remember to consider the long-term consequences each scenario will have for humanity. If humanity does not go extinct, it could go, on, could go on to a long future. This is true even if many, but not all, humans die in a catastrophe, since that leaves open the possibility of recovery. However, if humanity goes extinct, there will be no future for humanity. So the manipulation makes it clear that extinction means no future, and non-extinction uh, may mean uh, a long future. So it uh, emphasizes the badness uh, of extinction and losing the future. So it has an effect on, on that key value, whereas the other key value, the badness of individual suffering, isn't really affected. So overall, it uh, should again make more people find extinction uniquely bad. So here we found a similar effect as before, so 50% now found extinction to be uniquely bad. So, uh, but in the salience manipulation, we didn't really add any new information. We, we just highlighted certain inferences, which one in principle could have uh, been doing even in the control condition. So, but we also wanted to include one condition where we actually added uh, new information. So this was the good future manipulation. So here in the first outcome, we said not only that there's no catastrophe, but also humanity goes on to live for a very long time in a future which is better than today in every conceivable way. There are no longer any wars, any crimes, any people experiencing depression or sadness, and so on. So really a utopia. And then the second outcome was very similar. So here, of course, there was a catastrophe, but we recover from the catastrophe and then go on to the same utopia. Um, and then the third outcome here it was the same, but we also really emphasize that the extinction means that no humans will ever, ever live anymore and all of human knowledge and culture will be lost forever. So this was really very strong manipulation. We, we really hammered home the sort of extreme difference between these three, three different outcomes. So I think this should also be remembered when we look at the results here, because here we found quite uh, striking differences. Um, uh, as we will see in a, in a moment. So, uh, so this manipulation says then that the, the future will be very good if humanity survives uh, and that we would recover from a non-extinction catastrophe. So the manipulation then makes it worse to, to lose the future. So it affects that key value. But the other key value, badness of individual suffering, is not affected. So overall, it should make more people find extinction uniquely bad. And that's really what we've, we found here. 77% uh, found extinction uniquely bad, given that we would lose this very great future indeed. So uh, let's sum up then what we learned from these four experimental conditions about why people don't find extinction uniquely bad in the control condition. So one hypothesis we had was that this was before cause um, people, they focus strongly <laughs> on the badness of people dying uh, from the catastrophes. And this is something that we find because when we reduce the badness of individual suffering, as we did in the zebra manipulation and the sterilization manipulation, then we do find um, that more people find extinction to be uniquely bad. And then our second hypothesis was, of course, that people don't feel that strongly about the other key value, the lost future. And uh, here we find some support for that hypothesis as well, because one reason why people don't 
find, feel that strongly about that key value is that they, they don't consider the long-term consequences that much. And we know this because when we highlight the long-term consequences, as we did in the salience manipulation, then more people find extinction uniquely bad. And then another reason why they focus weakly on the lost future is that they have certain empirical beliefs which reduce the value of the future. So they may believe that the future will not be that good if humanity survives, and they may believe that we won't recover if 80% die. And we know this because when we said that uh, uh, the future will be good if humanity survives, and that we will recover if 80% die, as we did in the good future manipulation, then more people find extinction uniquely bad. So, uh, more briefly, I should also present another study that we ran involving an X-risk reducer sample. So this is a sample of people uh, focused on reducing existential risk, and we reduced this sample via the EA newsletter and social media, and some of you may have taken this uh, test, actually, so if so, I, I should thank you for helping our research. So here we had only two conditions. We had the control condition and we had the good future condition. So we hypothesized that nearly all participants would find the second difference greater uh, both in the control condition and in the good future condition. So nearly all participants would find extinction uniquely bad. And this was indeed what uh, we found. So that's a quite striking difference compared to lay people where we found a big difference between the good future condition and the, and the, and the control con condition. But among the, the extras reducers, we find that they find extinction uniquely bad, even in the absence of information about how good the future is gonna be. So uh, that sums up uh, what I had to say about this specific study. Uh, so let me now zoom out a little bit and say uh, some words about the psychology of existential risk and the long-term future in general. So we think that this is just one example of a study that one could run. We think that there could be many valuable studies in this area. And one reason why we think that is that it seems that there is a general fact about human psychology, which is that we think quite differently about different domains. So one example of this, which uh, should be close to mind to many EAs, is that we think, or people in general think very differently about charitable donations and individual consumption. So it seems that most people think much more about what they give for their, what they get for their money when it comes to individual consumption compared to uh, charity. So similarly, it may be that we think quite differently uh, when we think about the long-term future compared to when we think about shorter time frames. So it may be, for instance, that if we think about uh, the long-term future, we have a more collaborative mindset because we realize that in the long term, we're all you know, in the same boat. So I don't know whether that's the case. I'm speculating a bit here. But I think we, we have some uh, prior that we, we do have a unique way of thinking about the long-term future should be quite high. And it's important to learn whether that's the case and how we think about the long-term future. Because ultimately, we, we want to use that knowledge. We don't just want to gather this knowledge for its own sake, but we want to use that knowledge in the project that many of you, thankfully, are part of to create a long-term future, um, a great long-term future. So thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, so questions, as always, through the Bizabo app. And we've got a few already, plus through the website, london.eaglobal.org slash polls. First couple questions that came in uh, right at the beginning of your talk were about those 10% of people who kind of missed the boat, mm -hmm. and, like got the whole thing sort of flipped. Right. Uh, was there any follow-up on those folks, and what are they thinking? I, I think that Scott Alexander at some point posted, he had a blog post about... I don't remember the title, but it was a funny title, uh, so it's unfortunate I don't remember it. But he said that, you know, you always get this in, uh, on sort of Mechanical Turk, and then this other was prolific in other online platforms. You, you, you always get, the, you know, some responses which are difficult to uh, understand. So you very rarely get, you know, 100% 
yes on anything. So um, I wouldn't read in too much to those like 10%. And so th there was another question actually. This was Mechanical Turk. Yeah, sure. so um, uh, we run many studies on Mechanical Turk, but actually uh, the main study that I presented here, that was on a competitor to Mechanical Turk, which is called Prolific. And then we recruited British participants. Otherwise, on, on Mechanical Turk, we typically recruit American participants. And as I, I said at one point, uh, we also so actually ran a, a study on American participants, uh, so which sort of replicated this study that I now presented. But what I presented concerned British participants on Prolific. And you said the difference between the American and the British uh, responses they, was minimal. They, they were quite small, yes. That probably uh, answers the next question, but it's a funny one, so I'll ask it anyway. Uh -huh. Were there any differences in zebra affinity between Americans and Britons? Um, not that I recall. <laughs> Wouldn't think so, but uh, you know, inquiring minds want to know. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, did you consider, I thought this was a good question, did you consider a suffering-focused manipulation, uh, which I, I take to mean kind of focusing yeah. on the suffering of those, you know, left behind, so to speak? Ah, uh, okay, so not like a, I thought that what you meant by suffering focus was like a suffering-focused ethics, but more like uh, uh, a manipulation which, so, so then the hypothesis would be that uh, people wouldn't like the sort of middle outcome, uh, which is concerns near extinction, because then they empathize with those people who are left behind. Um, yes, uh, that's an interesting question. No, we have not considered such a hypothesis or as we'll, yet. But, um, that is indeed what the uh, questioner uh -huh. asked, or intended to ask. Right, uh, right, 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 the person right, right. says, I would expect this to reduce diff two below the control, meaning diff one. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess in the sterilization manipulation, there is significantly less, or there, there is substantially less uh, suffering involved in those. I mean, then what we say is that 80% can't have children, and the, the, the remaining 20% can have children. So there's like, I mean, there, there, there seems to be like le much less suffering going on in, in that scenario compared with the, the other scenarios. But, I haven't thought, thought through all the implications of that now, but, but that is certainly something to, to consider. A uh, handful of more questions coming in here in real time. Uh, I guess one question as I'm, as I'm surveying this is, so where do we go from here with this research? You've kind of mapped the, the, yeah. the feelings of the broad public as right. well as of the EA right. community, uh -huh. so now what? Yeah, so I mean, I guess one thing I, I found uh, interesting was, I mean, as I said, this like, good future manipulation is very strong. And so uh, it's, not, it's not obvious that quite as many would find extinction uniquely bad if we, we made that a bit weaker. But that said, we have some converging evidence to like the, the conclusions that I uh, that I said there. And that is that we had actually one other pre-study where we asked people more directly, like how good you think that the future will be if humanity survives, and then we found that they thought that the future is going to be slightly worse than the present, which seems somewhat unlikely on the basis of you know the first graph that I showed that you know the world has arguably become better, uh, well, you know, some people uh, don't agree with that, but, uh, but that, would, that would be my view. So it seems in general that one thing that's, uh, that stood out to me, that was that like, you know, people are probably fairly pessimistic uh, about the long-term future, and that may be one key reason um, why they don't consider human extinction so important. And, and I mean, in a sense, I find that that's good news because this is just something that you can inform people about. Uh, well, it might not be super easy, but it, it seems like somewhat tractable. Whereas if people had some sort of deeply held moral conviction uh, that you know extinction isn't that important, then you know it might have been harder to change people's minds. 
So that probably brings us to what should be our last question. Um, but before I ask that, you have office hours coming up today. Yes. And is that immediately after this talk? Yes. And I, I have that in room 728. So take the, uh, the lift up to 7, 728 immediately after this. Um, so we've kind of identified that people, by being made aware or just having this, the salience of the yeah. possible good future uh, brought to them, that they'll, they'll kind of take that more seriously and, yeah. and recalibrate. Uh, do you know of other ways to sort of shift or nudge people in that direction so that they will kind of more intuitively, more naturally take into account the, the possibility uh, that the future represents? Um, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, there was actually someone else who ran some like more informal studies where they sort of like mapped out the, the argument for the long term future. Um, and, you know, said that it was like broadly similar to the salience in, uh, manipulation, but it was much more information, basically, and also sort of ethical arguments. And, so, and then, uh, as I recall, that seemed to have like fairly strong effects. So, I, I mean, that, that falls broadly in the same ballpark, but it's basically that you inform people more comprehensively. Cool. Well, thank you very much. For more with Stefan Schubert, you can go to office hours at 728 immediately after this. For now, another round of applause for Stefan Schubert. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you.